Good morning and welcome to the Propeller Club of Northern California. It is Tuesday, July 13th, and I want to welcome you all here. Our guest speaker is Dr. Habib Dagar. He is the director of the Marine of the University of Maine's Advanced Structures and Composite Centers. And he launched the first floating offshore wind turbine back in 2013. And he is going to brief us on his latest adventures in the uh, Gulf of Maine. And he is about to launch uh, two serious uh, uh, wind turbines, one or, one or two, Habib. One, okay, very Just good. One, yep. Just one. And the relevance of the floating wind turbine is that it is suitable for waters off the coast of California. And we will be hearing from uh, Larry Otaker at the uh, uh, port of Humboldt Bay, who is visiting us from Eureka. And he's going to give us a little bit of an update about all of the millions of dollars he's been receiving to go and build an offshore wind port. So Larry, welcome. We'll hear from you in a second. Um, and uh, what I want to do is go through the introductions first. And uh, I think we are mostly here. And I will start with uh, uh, Todd Crawshaw. Good morning, Todd. Good morning. Uh, with Crawshaw Design, and we provide integrated brand marketing for print and the web, and also IT support and web hosting. Very good. I want to remind everybody again, please mute yourselves while we go through the introductions until I introduce you. Uh, and our next guest is, oh, we, okay, Amber, do you want to introduce yourself? You're up next here. Certainly, staff. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Amber Thompson. I am the Special Assistant for Strategic Initiatives at the Advanced Structures and Composite Center here at the University of Maine. I'm here with Dr. Dogger. Um, I provide direct support to him, but also work with the PNR management team to uh, develop and implement strategic programs and partnerships. So it's an absolute pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you, Amber. And you are the constant uh, right hand and support whenever we need to reach Dr. Dogger, which is sometimes a challenge because of his very busy schedule and multiplicity of responsibilities. Um, Anita Yao, good morning. Good morning. This is Anita Yao for uh, the Wolfinger for Port of San Francisco, one of the uh, uh, board of director of uh, this uh, organization. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. And I see brother Bill Nixon. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. Bill Nixon representing Transmarine Navigation Tramp Bulk Ship Agents. And how are things at the Port of Stockton? Moving right along, surprisingly, it's better than the uh, container businesses these days for us. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Um, our next, uh, Commander Alec Reddy. Good morning, sir. Uh, there we go. Uh, one of these days, I'll figure out the mute button. Good morning, uh, Commander Hale Alec Reddy. I'm the new Chief of Prevention for Sector San Francisco. Uh, I just replaced Commander Rob Rivera a couple weeks ago. And uh, Rob headed to Washington, D.C. to the Office of Marine Environmental Response. So very excited to be on this call uh, and to listen to Mr. Edgar and Dr. Dagar. And thanks so much for the invitation. Very good. Hale, thank you very much and welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, I see a celebrity from Southern California, Clay Sandage. Good morning. Thank you, Stoss. Yes, Clay Sandage. I'm the energy market sector leader at P2S and uh, very involved in community choice energy programs and uh, uh, very um, aggressively looking at how we get offshore wind in our waters off the coast of California. And Dr. Dagar, nice to see you again. I look forward to uh, this conversation. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Ellis Wallenberg, good morning, sir. Good morning, Stas. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. I represent Weiss Associates, we're environmental engineers, and uh, we're working at the Port of San Francisco, Port of Oakland, uh, Redwood City, uh, Port of Richmond, um, and have done other work for other ports uh, in the past. Uh, engineering and stormwater and brownfield type site cleanup stuff. 
Thank you, Stas. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, George Loria, good morning. My boss and editor in chief of the American Journal of Transportation. George, you're on mute. You're still on mute. That mute button is tricky there. George, I'm going to come back to you in just a second. Let me get uh, Dr. Dr. Dangar, and if you, oh, there you are. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah. I'm, uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. And you are? You are. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> George Laureate, editor in chief, American Journal of Transportation. Good morning, George. Again, thanks. <laughs> okay. Take care, buddy. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dagar, good morning. You need to unmute yourself, Habib. Good morning and good afternoon from Maine. It's about two in the afternoon in, uh, in the great state of Maine. And uh, we're as far from, from uh, California as, as, as we can be. But right behind me, you see a beautiful Maine lighthouse. And, uh, and right uh, on the other side, you see a floating wind turbine off the lighthouse that we put out there in 2013. So uh, I'm at the, I work at the University of Maine and, and I uh, run the Composite Center at the University. Looking forward to talk to you about what we're doing in Maine and floating wind technologies. Thank you very much, Habib. Uh, Kevin Policarpo, good morning, sir. Morning, Sas. How are you? Okay, and you are a student at Santa Rosa Junior College, if I'm correct? That's correct. Okay, good morning. Uh, Kim Arave, good morning, Kim. Kim, I can't hear you. I can see you opening your mouth, but I cannot hear you. You're on, you want to unmute yourself? Uh, okay. Uh, Kim, uh, I can't hear you. When you come back on, we will introduce you. Uh, Larry Otaker. Larry, good morning from Eureka. Good morning. I'm Larry Otter. I'm the executive director of the Humboldt Bay Harbor District, which operates the port of Humboldt uh, Bay, and I'll give you an overview in a minute. Very good, Larry, and we'll be hearing from you in a moment. Uh, Matt Wartian. Matt, good morning. Matt, you've got some interference for some reason. Stop yeah, stop laughing, Marone. I see you over there. Matt, try that again. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, and Matthew. Blankowski. Good morning, Matthew. Yeah. Hi, Stas. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm here with the dual purpose. I, I work for Gloucester up in Seattle. Um, we have our own uh, interest in offshore floating wind, developed the Pelastar Floating Foundation. And, and in part of that development, we actually work with, um, with uh, Dr. Dogger and the University of Maine. This was back in the early 2010s. And I actually that's how I found my job because I interned with um, Dr. Dogger at the Composite Center and had a great internship there. I'm also uh, born and raised in Maine, and, and so um, many reasons to be here today. Thanks for having me. Oh, great. That's good. And um, I'm interested to hear that. Kim Arabe, you are unmuted, sir. Yes, I am. Thank you. That was challenging. Um, <laughs> as a uh, Cal Maritime graduate, I congratulate the maniacs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm uh, affiliated now. I'm retired. Uh, Captain Merchant, U.S. Merchant Marine, but I now uh, affiliate with the Red Oak Victory in Richmond, the sole surviving victory, helped us win the World War II. And are you open for business? Yes, Tuesday, Thursday. Very good. You know, if you could, uh, we, we, we need to do something on the, uh, our, our website. If you could send me something, we'll post it on the website so 
we get people to direct some traffic in your direction. That would be great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. Ah, and we have another celebrity from Southern California, the Honorable Stella Ursua. Good morning, Stella. Oh, hi, Stas. How you doing? My name is Stella Ursua. I'm the Partnerships Manager from Grid Alternatives, and we have offices throughout uh, California. I'm stationed in L.A., but very interested in um, uh, wind, and we're doing a lot of solar and battery storage projects now. We have a huge workforce development project, so I'm always interested in learning more about some potential projects that we might connect with. Thank you for inviting me, Stas. Okay, Stella, thank you very much. All right. I'm the Honorable Nicholas Marone. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Stas. It's such a pleasure to see you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this uh, very informative day. Uh, I represent the Seafarers International Union, uh, supplying professional seafarers for the last 85 years. Um, I'm hoping to do it for another 85. Thank you. Very good. Now, Nick, I read this morning that we are having that only 5% of mariners are vaccinated on uh, foreign flag vessels around the world. Um, and at the same time, we still have a bunch of people who are stuck on ships from last year. I saw a letter from a captain yesterday saying that he had been at anchor for 16 months and hadn't get, gotten paid. What are we doing to get these guys ashore? Well, it's, it's complicated. A lot of those countries, such as the Philippines and, and the other big maritime supplying nations, signed on with Astrica for their vaccine and never left an alternative. So a country like the Philippines is really cut short now in trying to get their hands on uh, Johnson & Johnson and, and the Pfizer vaccine. Some countries are coming around through the help of the IMO and the United Nations to allow uh, seafarers egress and uh, access uh, through their airports in order to do relief work and change out crews. So it's a slow uh, comeback, but it, it is a comeback. Very good. Nick, thank you very much. And I see Tony Petronio. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Stas. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Tony Petronio, general manager at uh, Storm Geo. Uh, we do uh, ship routing services and more importantly, we're a weather company. So this is a very appropriate topic for us. Very good. Uh, Tony, welcome. And uh, I see Frank's phone. Uh, who is Frank's phone? Hi, Stas. Frank Ramirez with the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Mr. Ramirez. I, you're hiding behind that uh, blank there. So uh, if we're attracting new business to California, like offshore floating wind turbines, that would be good for the state, right? Absolutely. Matter of fact, I just left uh, to join this meeting. Uh, BOEM is having a, a meeting right now uh, on, on this very same topic. Very good. Frank, uh, we'd like to be, in, actually, we need to get you to do a, a longer presentation at some point. Uh, and I, we, we need to confab about that, but thank you very much for being here. And we always welcome your participation and your support. Thank you, glad to be here. Thank you. And I also see uh, the Honorable Peter Dreyfus here uh, this morning. Uh, Peter, do you wanna uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Peter Dreyfus with Watermaster North America. Uh, we are manufacturing a 40-foot amphibious dredger for 20 foot of depth and less. We're doing shoreline remediation, and we're doing a Jones Act compliant vessel under its own power, and we're building it in Michigan. And we're doing okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Evie Wong. Good morning, Evie. Good morning, Stas. Um, Evie Wong with Alba Wills Up. Um, I'm also president of the Customs Brokers Borders Association. And uh, this sounded really interesting. I'm into green um, industries and um, uh, would be interested to see what this might mean for our West Coast. Thank uh you. 
Evie, uh, how are how is our congestion situation going? Are we getting anything? Uh, are we still having long delays at the Port of Oakland? Um, I think Oakland is getting a little better, but uh, there's still a lot of blank sailings, and uh, LA is starting to get backed up again. And uh, sadly, the um, carriers, uh, at least one carrier that I know of, have put out a congestion fee of $1,000 for um, um, having congestion, of which uh, us users of the port have no control over. Um, so I've uh, asked um, Peter Friedman to look into that and uh, other issues that are affecting both import and exports. Um, we have a long way to go before this gets uh, resolved um, through this year. Well, George Laureate, the editor in chief of the American Journal of Transportation is listening to this. So I, I hope that we'll do some follow up there. And uh, I, it, does, it, it sounds like we're still a long ways from getting back to some sort of normalcy. The steamship to rail Part of it is broken. Um, Stas, we've talked at length about rail and it's just broken. So um, my last call, and I don't want to take up too much time, but um, basically the carrier um, took some freight off and basically said, we're going to drop it here. You figure out how to get it inland. Jeez. So the irresponsibility of that, that is um, of a service provider. Uh, it is not acceptable, but there we are. So anyway, I do not want to digress from, from this, but um, it is a ongoing sore point. Um, so, yeah. Evie, I, I would like us to follow up uh, with a, uh, uh, a presentation in the fall about how these supply chain issues are impacting us, uh, both as exporters and importers. And I think we need to hear some of the things that you and your colleagues are seeing. Uh, and I will get back to you because we need to do something and get this out. I mean, this is going on and it doesn't seem to be getting it's any better. It's not getting any better. It's getting worse. So, yeah. Uh, okay, Evie, thank you very thank you much. Thank you for the diversion today. I'm sorry? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, and now, last but not least, I believe I see somebody named Dennis, who I believe is Mr. Dennis Dysinger. Dennis, is that you? It is, Stas. Uh, having a good day today. Um, Dennis Dysinger with Mare Island Dry Dock. And uh, I've been following the, the offshore wind for a while. And uh, coming to this coast, we believe our facility would, uh, would be a prime for helping service the offshore vessels. So I'm very interested to, to seeing this industry build and, and giving us a new uh, uh, new customers. Very good. Uh, Dennis, thank you very much. And thank you for your support from uh, Mayor Allen Dry Dock. Uh, OK, uh, we are ready with our first. Uh, uh, we're going to have ask uh, Larry Otteker to come back on and give us a, uh, a short presentation about what the status is up at Humboldt Bay. Uh, uh, Larry is the executive director of the Humboldt Bay Harbor District, and that is in Eureka, California, for those of you who do not know. And a very exciting development. Um, uh, the port has been awarded a considerable sum of uh, federal grants to build up an offshore wind port. Uh, Larry, good morning. Larry, I cannot hear you. Must be on mute. Larry, you're on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, so, so we are prepared. We are preparing California's offshore wind ports. And uh, if many of you don't know, we're California's second largest natural bay. We're larger than San Diego, but not as big as San Francisco. And uh, 30 miles directly off of Humboldt Bay is the proposed uh, Humboldt uh, call area. And the, the Humboldt call area has the best wind resources in the entire 
uh, continental United States land resources or offshore wind resources 30 miles off of Humboldt Bay. So Humboldt Bay has approximately six miles of federally maintained navigation channel uh, with 48 feet at the entrance and 38 uh, feet at the, uh, the main entrance. And so we basically work to put together a conceptual master plan uh, for about 170 acres of, uh, for a proposed offshore wind terminal where you could do the assembly, you could do the full, um, assemble them fully upright. We have no overhead obstructions. You could also do a manufacturing facility uh, within the port uh, and basically feed the entire uh, system that we looked at. And so we're centrally located uh, right between all the way up from Washington to San Diego, right in the very middle. And we have hundreds of acres of vacant and underutilized coastal dependent uh, lands with no air draft restrictions. And so we think we're uniquely situated for the offshore wind industry. And so we really wanna thank the Biden administration, Newsom, Governor Newsom and uh, the Cal California Natural Resource and Energy Commission you know, for their leadership. In the governor's budget, they appropriated 10.4 million for the port to assist us to develop a new offshore wind uh, terminal. We've also received EPA brownfield funding and we're looking to submit a grant to the Port Infrastructure Development Program uh, in July of this year. So literally within the next two months, we're submitting a grant to develop this new port infrastructure uh, grant. And the state basically says that we have to uh, spend this money by June of 2024. And so we're, we're moving this thing forward. We're not sitting on our hands. We're moving this thing forward. And Bohm is saying they're going to issue the lease off of the Humboldt and Central Coast in early 2022. That was the agreement between the Biden administration and Governor Newsom, and they're uh, actively working on that right now. There's an AB 525 in the legislature that says by March, they're supposed to give a report to the legislature on workforce, supply chains, ports, and, and other needs. And so, you know, the big question for the Harbor District is do we wait for Bohm or uh, the other uh, entities to catch up? And our board has basically said, no, we're moving forward and we're beginning the permitting process for the full 168 acres to build the new uh, offshore wind terminal for the full assembly component integration with vertical assembly uh, and manufacturing uh, facilities. And we're hoping to prepare the port so that we can begin construction uh, for this new terminal uh, in 2024, 2025 time period. And so, I think that what really we're, we're doing in Humboldt is we're trying to shave time uh, because in the end, we have to meet the needs of the offshore wind industry. When Bohm, uh, it's a significant investment that the industry wants to do. And so we're working with a broad spectrum of organizations uh, to prepare the port of Humboldt. And so thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry, you're muted. You must be muted. Stas, you're on mute. Mr. Saucer on mute. Got it. Sorry about that. I pushed the wrong button too. Now Nick is really going to laugh. Uh, okay. Larry, thank you very much. I have a quick question. You're going to need how many people working up there? Uh, well, we just completed a uh, economic analysis uh, and, um, you know, the, the the, the workforce shows that just for the port facilities, we're going to need uh, a couple of thousand people just for the construction uh, of the port facilities. And um, really within the larger statewide organizations, because obviously not everything will occur in Humboldt, there'll be in some of the other ports, uh, uh, some of the components, you know, they're saying up to 14,000 jobs associated with this uh, for the state of California. Very good. Larry, thank you very much for this uh update and uh, very good luck to you as you go along it this is going to be an ongoing story and uh, a, a real sharp good and in, uh, hopefully a long-term shot in the arm for the economy of the uh, north northern california and humboldt bay uh, i want to now introduce our speaker habib dagar uh, habib is a pioneer in the floating offshore uh, wind business for the United States. 
Uh, he's been involved in every aspect of uh, the design and operation and implementation. And uh, we have been uh, acquaintances and friends uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, he's been out in California visiting ports uh, hosted in part uh, by Clay Sandage. We met with the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, thanks to Clay. And Habib has stuck in there through thick and thin. Uh, there have been some very tough years for him when there was great hostility in certain circles to offshore wind. He has uh, overcome these uh, obstacles. He has continued to do the kind of first-rate work that he's done. Uh, in fact, uh, the department is also involved in uh, other issues using concrete and uh, composite materials, including something called a bridge in a backpack. And uh, his department recently uh, built a patrol boat, an 89-foot patrol boat, uh, using a 3D printing process. We have discussed the struggle to make these turbines in the United States and not depend on foreign shipyards to do that. And Habib's development of uh, a concrete and composite materials has facilitated that process. And without more introduction, I wish to introduce our keynote speaker, Habib Dagar. Thank you, Stas. Great pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, wonderful to see all the great work ongoing in California right now. Sorry, Larry, your project's very exciting. And uh, Matthew, it's good to see you again. Clay, good to see you again. Uh, and um, I'm going to, um, Stas asked me to give an overview of what we've been doing in Maine in floating offshore wind. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, yes. So um, yeah, yeah, I'll talk about the work we've been doing in Maine, uh, how we got started, some of the tribulations we went through, and where we're heading in the future. Um, I work at the University of Maine Advanced Structures and Composite Center with the largest university-based research center in the state of Maine with about 260 employees. Um, the technology we've developed was specifically designed so you can actually make the hulls here in the United States rather than import the hulls. Uh, and so we can fabricate them here. So the hulls, the floating hulls we're looking at are made out of concrete. Uh, this, this project is funded in part by the DOE Advanced Technology Demonstration Program for Offshore Wind. Um, and uh, I'll tell you more about it. But in terms of what this hull looks like, uh, notice you've got the floating hull. What's yellow is above the water, what's gray is under the water. This particular technology has a concrete hull. So the whole thing is made out of pre-stressed concrete very much like you build pre-stressed concrete bridges over waterways. Um, it has four flotation columns, one in each corner, one in the center that supports the tower and the turbine. Uh, the, the, the four flotation columns are tied together under the water with beams. Uh, these are concrete beams. Uh, each flotation column has essentially air in it. It's a big concrete air can. And, and uh, what's under it is also concrete boxes that tie, tie the three beams together. Uh, the unit is um, moored to the seabed with three mooring lines, uh, one, two, and three that you see at each corner. And the undersea cable, uh, the cable, the electrical cable, uh, makes a lazy S wave, as you see right over here. So the lazy S wave uh, comes from, the, the, the cable comes from, a, of course, the turbine down the tower, down the side of the hull, and out through a J-tube. And, and there's some buoyancy modules uh, for the dynamic portion of the cable and the cable goes back to the seabed and typically is buried where you, where you can. So that's, kinda, that's called a semi-submersible hull. There are other types of hull designs out there. That's the one we've, we've designed in Maine. We have some patents on it. A and the purpose of that design is to be able to make it locally. So you can make it anywhere, not only in Maine, but throughout the US as well. It's been approved by the American Bureau of Shipping as well. And, and then the US Department of Energy through the National Renewable Energy Lab did an independent study to see how much it would cost, uh, to the, how much electricity would cost from this hull when you scale it up, when you make in a thousand megawatt turbines, a thousand megawatt farms like Larry would like to do up in Humboldt, Humboldt Bay. Uh, that, that, that cost would be, would go below six cents a kilowatt hour once we start scaling this technology up. And once we have port facilities like the one that uh, Larry wants to build in Humboldt Bay. 
Uh, so so uh, looking at our research center, this is where I work. Um, uh, this is the uh, uh, research center that we work at. It's an integrated research center that allow us to design materials, build structure and test them under one roof. I'll show you inside the lab a little bit. Here's an example of some of the testing we do in the lab. This is a wind blade being tested uh, in our laboratory. That's a 160 foot blade being tested. Notice that the blade tip is about to touch the ceiling and the floor. Uh, and we have one actuator at, at the bottom that's uh, moving the whole thing using what we, um, uh, resonant fatigue testing. So we do that working with turbine suppliers to um, verify their designs or to develop new types of wind blade designs that would hold up. Um, inside our lab, we also have an offshore wind laboratory. It's an ocean engineering lab. Uh, there's a lot of wave basins, as you know, uh, in your business uh, across the country. There's a lot of wind tunnels across the country, but nobody's put the two together yet. So we're the very first to do that. So we put a wind tunnel on top of a wave basin in order for us to be able to test floating wind turbine designs. And, uh, and that's a floating wind turbine uh, in front of um, a, 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 our, uh, our laboratory. Uh, notice the kind of waves we can create in the laboratory, but also the wind uh, regime that we can create allows us to change wind speed with height. So we can actually model the speed increasing of the wave, uh, wind with height, change the wind directions. Uh, and we typically test uh, um, products at 150 scale. So it's like a big physics experiment. We scale everything down to figure out what happens in extreme storms in the laboratory. Uh, there's a lot going on on the East Coast. This is a chart uh, about the uh, the other coast, if you wish. Uh, the uh, there's uh, what you see in orange are the different projects being planned on the East Coast of the U.S. As you know, President Biden uh, announced a plan here a couple of months ago of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 along the East Coast, um, and uh, some of the states are moving forward quickly. Uh, uh, are Massachusetts with um, uh, 800 megawatt uh, projects uh, already in the pipeline. And New York has 9,000 megawatts as well of, of a plan for 9,000 megawatts. New Jersey, 7,500 megawatts. What you see in orange are the size of those planned projects. Um, so the bigger the orange, the bigger the project is. Uh, our project off the coast of Maine I'll be talking about is called New England Aquaventus One. It's the, it's the only pro floating project on the East Coast right now because Maine has deep waters off of its coast. Uh, this is a map put together by the National Renewable Energy Lab showing uh, how deep the waters are um, and where floating technology makes sense. Um, typically, you could use floating technology when the water depth is about 150 feet or more. Um, and if you look at the east and west coast, of course, the west coast, you see all dark blue. Uh, uh, because you have really deep waters and you have no choice on the West Coast but to use floating technologies. On the East Coast, you see some of the light blue areas there. That's when you can use actually fixed bottom turbines. This is where the water depth is less than 150 feet and you, fix, you can fix the turbine to the seabed. Essentially, the most common technology used is called a, um, a, a monopile where you actually have a big steel pile that you drive into the seabed and you come in and, and put a tower on top of it and the turbine on top of it. Um, but um, if you look at the east coast of the United States, there's a lot of shallower areas uh, in light blue where you can actually use fixed bottom turbines. But if you look at Maine, notice the dark blue off the coast of Maine. So if we're going to do anything in Maine, it's got to be floating technologies, just like California. So there's a big, big uh, thing in common between Maine and California. We can only use floating technologies in both states. Now, now we don't have uh, deep, deep, as deep waters as you do. You have water depth of uh, you know, 800 meters or a kilometer or more. In Maine, our water depth are less. The deep waters are more in the 200 to 300 meter depth. So we don't have uh, as deep waters as you do, but we still have waters that are deep enough that we have to float uh, the turbines. Uh, the, um, uh, in, in Maine, the reason we got into this is, if you recall, um, about 13 years ago, uh, fossil fuel prices, gasoline prices went up to $4 a gallon. You remember those days? The $4 a gallon days? Uh, how many of you believe we're not gonna go there again? <laughs> okay, it's just a matter of time, right? So, so, so the state of Maine was in crisis mode because not only do we use gasoline, but in Maine we use heating oil to heat our homes. 
And um, we were spending, uh, the average family in Maine was spending close to $10,000 a year between heating oil and gasoline and electricity. Most of it is heating oil and gasoline. So, uh, so it was not sustainable for Maine. For Maine, there was a big concern that many small male communities would have to actually empty out because you can't afford to heat your homes anymore. Um, and uh, so we started a, a floating offshore wind program about 14 years ago in the state of Maine. Um, and and we, we put a plan together, a very ambitious plan at the time, um, about a decade ago, that calls for um, using 3% of the offshore wind resource in the state of Maine in order for us to electrify heating and transportation. That means eventually one of those days we'll all be driving electric cars and using our home, heating our homes using electrical heat pumps. In your case, you'd be cooling them using electric heat pumps, but in Maine would be heating them using electric heat pumps. So what we, we calculated that if we actually um, harness five gigawatts of offshore wind, we can heat every home and drive every car in the state of Maine with five gigawatts of offshore wind. And that's about 3% of the offshore wind resource within 50 miles of the coast of Maine. So it doesn't take a lot, just 3% of that offshore wind area off the coast of Maine is enough to heat every home and drive every car. So we, we embarked on this plan. And uh, now how do you float a wind turbine? There's a lot of different designs for floating wind turbines. And, and many of you are familiar with those if you're in the oil and gas business. A lot of the floating wind turbine designs actually came from the oil and gas industry. Um, and there are three types of designs. One's called the spar buoy, one's called the semi-submersible, one is called the tension leg platform. As, as Matthew said earlier uh, at Gloucester, we've worked with you all on, on, a, on, a, on a tension leg platform design. So what's the major difference between these designs? Uh, the major difference I I I I between a spar and a semi, uh, these first two, if you wish, is the depth of the hull. In a spar design, the hull is very deep. You need 300 feet of water depth just to float your hull. Uh, so, and the hull is made, uh, is like a big floating tube with a ballast at the bottom. So you have a big, essentially, air cam, uh, could be you know, 20, 25 feet in diameter and, and 30, 300 feet long. Or, uh, and uh, and in, order, in order for you to do that, you need uh, very deep waters near the shore in order for, us, for you to put the tower and turbine on and tow it out to sea. Um, and, and, and that would be a challenge even in Humboldt Bay, if you wish, Larry, for you to do any spar designs out there. I'm sure you're looking at other designs. Um, now, now, the spar buoy has three mooring lines on it to keep it on station. Uh, um, and um, now the next design is called a semi-submersible. The semi-submersible is like a boat, essentially, uh, but it's a multi-hull boat. Uh, most of you know what a catamaran is. A catamaran has two hulls. And the farther out you put the two hulls, the more stable the hull is, or the boat is, and the bigger the hull is, the more stable the boat is. Yes, you're less likely to capsize the cat. Now, what, what I'm showing you here is a trimaran. Essentially, you have one, two, and three hulls, and, and the towers in the center. That's an example of a semi-submersible design. Um, and again, you have three mooring lines on it. The advantage of the semi over, over a spar buoy is a, is a draft. This thing will draft, in our design, we have a draft of about 25 feet dockside. So this is something that uh, um, Larry can handle in Humble Bay very easily. Uh, so we have a 25 foot draft and, and, and then dockside and you tow the unit out to sea, then you add ballast to the, to, the, um, uh, to the hull and you ballast it down to about 40 or 45 feet of water depth of, of draft. Uh, now this has also three mooring lines on it to keep it on station. The last design is called the tension leg platform. The advantage of that is that it's a smaller hull, it's a small hull versus the rest. The disadvantage is you need expensive mooring lines. So the mooring lines and attention leg platforms need actually very expensive anchors uh, that you have to drive into the seabed. And, and the way that the, the tension leg platform works, it's like a buoy that wants to pop out of the water, but you have three tension legs that keep it, keep it under the water. So, so basically you have buoyancy in, that, in the mooring, in, in, the, um, in, uh, in the hull that wants to, to pop it out. Uh, the, the disadvantage of that is when you go to California, when you have 800, 900 meters of water depth or 1,000 meters of water depth, you couldn't afford to build a tension leg platform because of the flexibility of the mooring line. You'd have a very, think, think about an, you know, a, a, a you know, 3,000 foot long mooring line uh, uh, that, that, that's very stiff. Uh, you can't make it very stiff. Yeah, it has to be, it becomes very big and very expensive. And you need also uh, expensive anchors for that. So the hull on a tension leg platform 
is less expensive than the hull on a semi-submersible. But by the time you add very long mooring lines and anchors, uh, and then, then depending on the, on the, on the site, site, you might end up being less expensive with a semi than with a tension leg platform. Um, so back, back in, in 2013, we built a one to eight scale version of our floating turbine. And, and uh, this is what it looks like um, at, at the time. That's version 1.0 and launched it uh, off the coast of Maine. You could see the hull being towed out to sea using a Maine Maritime uh, vessel, actually. We partnered with Maine Maritime Academy and towed it out to sea. And then we towed it to Castine, Maine. In Castine, we had three steel chain mooring lines buoyed on top and an electrical cable installed and buoyed and we hooked it up. This is what it looked like when it was hooked up. We had an undersea cable that went back to shore. And, and that's what it looked like when, it, when the first storm arrived off the, Gulf, the, the coast of Maine. This was in December, 2015. It was called Winter Storm Electra. Uh, and, and you could see here what's blown across is snow. This is not, not cloud, that's snow. And you could see the, the size of the white caps uh, on the water. Uh, that was a 50 year storm relative to the size of the hull because it was one to eight scale hull. And, and, um, and a, a 50 year wave in the Gulf of Maine from peak to trough is about a 60 foot high wave. So this thing is seeing relative to its size 60 foot high waves uh, and you can't see it move, right? Okay, so that's the key to the design is designing the hull that's not activated by the wave environment. And the key to do that is develop a pitch, um, develop um, a, 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 a periods of motion for the hull that are outside the wave energy excitation range. Our pitch uh, 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 and, and uh, periods are, uh, are over 25 seconds. Uh, and, and the maximum waves we see in the Gulf of Maine have about uh, 17 to 20 second uh, periods. So they don't activate the hull. So that being a successful program, the next step of our project is to build a bigger unit. So we're building a, a 11 megawatt uh, uh, class hull um, uh, right now. Um, and, and we've got the Department of Energy funding part of that. And then two private companies that are also interested in California, RWE and Mitsubishi working with us uh, on the project. Uh, each, one, each one of these three partners are putting $50 million in the, in the, in the project. Uh, what's unique about our hull is that it can be made in pieces and put together. So the hull is made with five concrete segments. They're like big five, five big concrete Legos. And you cast them in place and then post tension them together, uh, assemble them together. Uh, so you can actually mass produce them just like you mass produce segmental concrete bridges. So, so, so the, the technology is borrowed from the oil and gas, from the, from the bridge construction industry. Uh, I, I tell everybody we're turning bridge builders into hull builders. So if you can build a segmental concrete bridge, you can build our hull. So, so, uh, so, so in, in your environment, um, the facility you're putting together, Larry, would also lend itself to this kind of uh, manufacturing as well, because you can segmentally make these segments right, right in your 170 or 160 uh, acre facility and, and then post tension them and put them into the water. So uh, this is an example of a bridge between Maine and New Hampshire uh, and using that uses this technology. Notice. The bridge um, uh, is called the Sierra Long Bridge. Uh, these are the concrete segments that were precast near the bridge site. They were lifted and stacked on top of one another. They're about 20 feet wide each, and they were post-tensioned vertically to form one big column for the bridge. It's the same technology we're using to make the hull, except all of this is being done on shore. Once you assemble the hull, you put it into the water. You're not building anything in the water. And our, our goal is to uh, put this hull in the water, start, we start construction for this hull next year, and, and then put it into the water in, 20, end of 20, in 2024. Um, the mooring anchors we're using um, are, are um, drag anchors that look like that. You drag them along the seabed, they embed themselves into the mud. And recently we've decided to use synthetic mooring lines versus steel chains for the hull as well. We'll have three synthetic mooring lines for the hull. Uh, one of the big issues we, we were faced with is getting the environmental ecological data for the site done. We started doing fish surveys and, and, and bird surveys and marine mammal surveys almost uh, over a decade ago on, for the project. You don't have to do a decade worth of work, but we started our work about a decade ago uh, to do that. And we've done noise surveys, electromagnetic field surveys, geophysical surveys, and aesthetics and visual surveys and so forth. 
Um, uh, one of the questions I always like, get asked, how you bring the power back to shore? This is, this is how the power cable uh, looks like. I talked about that a bit earlier, but the power cable from each turbine comes down through a J tube uh, at the base of the hull to keep it from fatiguing at that joint. And then, and then you, there's some buoyancy modules added to the hull so, so, the, so the cable floats in, um, near the hull, if you wish. And it can, it can follow the hull as the hull moves around. Because the hull is more to the seabed, it moves around in a circle, uh, within a circle. Uh, and, and then the cable has to follow it. And that's called the dynamic cable. Now notice the cable follows it. Uh, it's got an S shaped. And the cable eventually is tethered to the seabed using a gravity anchor. And from there on, we typically bury the cable. We try to bury the cable six feet in the mud and so we can continue to fish uh, in those areas. You can't always do that, but that's what we try to do. Um, it, it, we've, done, we've had these cables in the Gulf of Maine to, uh, to power islands for a long time. And uh, here's an example of a cable that was installed in 1955 in Maine between Islesboro uh, and the mainland to power Islesboro. So uh, this is our cable we plan to use for our single unit from Monhegan Island, where our project is. It's about 14 miles offshore. And we're going to bring the cable back to shore in state waters and plug it in uh, to Booth Bay Harbor in Maine. The cable is about, it's going to be between six and eight inch in diameter for that 11 megawatt unit. Uh, and this is the cable survey, survey we've done in April uh, of last year to identify what the seabed looks like. And notice here in dark brown are actually outcrops of rocks. We can't, we don't want to bury the cable there. Initially, the cable was going to go through. That was the initial cable route that we had. That was we estimated on paper first, and we now did the survey, and and then now we're rerouting the cable around the obstruction so we can bury it uh, to the extent that we can. We had to work with the fishermen quite a bit to do the survey, and and we had we had to send a mailer to twelve hundred fishermen to do the survey, and even that even then there was uh, there was a uh, uh, there was some uh, issues with fishermen uh, and. And uh, about the cable, about about the, particularly the cable, and I'm sure that's issues that you'll be facing with uh, uh, in in California as well. Uh, we have we're working very closely with the fishermen. We have a lot of respect for them, and that's why we're trying to bury the cable so that we minimize impact uh, on the fisheries. Of course, we're not going to be able to bury it everywhere, but we're trying to bury it whenever we can. That's why we're running these surveys. Uh, to give you a sense of the mooring lines and anchors, you'll, you'll be facing that in California. Do you use steel chain mooring lines or do you use synthetic mooring lines? Uh, we, we decided to go to synthetics for our project. That decision was made over the last month. Um, and that's what a single chain in a steel chain mooring line looks like. So they're not tiny, <laughs> as, as you might imagine. And that's what a, a, a synthetic mooring line looks like next to a six foot human being. Um, and that's a six inch diameter piece of steel that's bent into that shape to make one link in that chain. So imagine if you had, uh, if you have, a, uh, you know, 3000 feet of water depth or 2400 feet of water depth, you're gonna have three of these mooring lines, each with, with chains like that. It gets pretty heavy, doesn't it? Okay, so, so you, you may wanna be looking at, uh, you know, synthetic mooring lines as well because they're about 1 20th the weight of a steel chain. So we're going in that direction, at least uh, in Maine. Uh, so here's our schedule in Maine. As I said, in 2013, we put a one to eight scale floating turbine off Monhegan Island, uh, off uh, Castine, Maine. In 2023, 24, we're gonna put an 11 megawatt demonstrator. In 2025, we're gonna do a 12 turbine array. And then eventually by the end of the 2020s, which is, coincides with your schedules in California, we're gonna go to commercial farms. Uh, larger commercial farms. Now, uh, now that's a bit of uh, a crawl before you walk, walk before you run approach that we, we're employing in the state of Maine. And if you ask me what's the biggest challenge you've had is really, it's not technical, it's really uh, outreach with the fishing industry. That was our biggest challenge in the state of Maine. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll be comparing notes as time progresses. Actually, tomorrow, uh, I'll be uh, giving a talk as part of the California um, uh, 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 conferences on, on offshore wind as well. So, um, and I know um, I'd like to close with this because um, Star said we printed a boat in Maine uh, using a 3D printer and I figured I'd show you that. Uh, we actually, this was a 50, uh, 25 foot vessel, 5,000 pound that we printed in three days. It's a, it's a 
tri-hull vessel. It's got a center hull and, and two hulls. We printed that using um, our printer at the university. It's the largest uh, polymer printer in the world. Um, so we started printing this boat on, um, on, on Thursday night. At 10 o'clock at night, we finished on Sunday night at 10.15 p.m. That's September 19th through 22nd. This is a, um, the, the 3D printer printing the boat. Um, and uh, this is, of course, three days scrunched up in, in one minute for you to look at it. But this is how we printed the boat. Um, and um, and, uh, and uh, anyway, we're working right now on printing a mold for a crew transfer vessel um, uh, project that's going to be about 60 feet as well. Anyway, uh, I know, Stas, you want me to show that, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Abi, thank you very much. Uh, this is very interesting. <clears throat> You've made a lot of progress. Um, you, uh, I, I have a quick question. Uh, you made a reference to six cents per kilowatt hour. Is that a goal over a period of time? Y yes, indeed. I'm going to... Um... Let's stop sharing so I can see you all a little bit better. The answer is yes. I mean, that six cents a kilowatt is a very aggressive goal. Uh, there's been a number of studies done on the cost of floating offshore wind. Um, and, and those studies, whether you're in Europe or in the US, whether you're an NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, or you're one of the California labs, people have been kind of focusing on six cents a kilowatt hour, if you wish, as being the cost of floating. But that's not going to happen until we, we have facilities like Larry's trying to build unless Larry builds a facility like this, none of us are getting it to six cents a kilowatt hour. So, so, so they're buried in that six cents a kilowatt hour uh, number is, is uh, the, the cost of, of Larry's facility that needs to kind of get built first before we can get to those numbers. And, and facilities like Larry just need to get humming, okay, before, before we can get down to six cents a kilowatt hour. So you really got to get to the fourth factory model that Larry's looking at to, to build so that we can get those costs down. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, George Laurier, do you have a question? I think, sure. George, you, you must be uh, muted still. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can. Yes, yes we can, George. Okay, uh, I was still coming back to the point of getting the cables ashore. Uh, that seems to be, I think, the biggest hang up, again, be, partly because of the fishermen, but partly because of where they must come ashore and how they would fit into the grid, particularly on the East Coast. I know we've seen a number of studies on that. Uh, but, but what's your sort of thoughts on that, uh, uh, especially on the East Coast? Uh, George, you, you 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 said it just right. <laughs> okay, uh, it's a, it's a big big issue, uh, and um, I think uh, one of the one of the things we're doing right now is every project's trying to bring a cable to shore. Every project wants its own extension cord, and 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 then I think in order for this to work better, I think we need a strategy, a national strategy, uh, for for plugging into the grid, regional and national strategies, rather than each state, each project bringing its power to shore. That's what Europe's done. They have developed a strategy to, to um, uh, whereas um, you develop essentially an offshore uh, transmission line uh, uh, that runs parallel to the shore and then projects can plug right into it and back to shore. Uh, that, that would be a better, more effective way of moving f things forward that would take into account regional needs, uh, both electricity needs as well as um, national needs. Uh, another advantage of doing that is, is if you have a cable that stretches across multiple states um, and you've got multiple farms plugged into this offshore, if you wish, highway, uh, electrical highway, um, you, can, you can average uh, the power across multiple states. So if there's less wind in one area, you have more wind in another area and, and, and that gets, uh, you can balance, if you wish, geographically, the availability of wind uh, as well. So, um, so uh, I, to answer your question, George, Get, get states working together, hopefully through national leadership regionally and others uh, to plan uh, offshore transmission for, for offshore wind would be very helpful. So. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, Clay Sandage, you've got a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dagar, you, you mentioned that the uh, fishing community is one of your mm -hmm. biggest challenges in Maine. In California, as, as we uh, met with the ports of LA and Long Beach, there was a plethora of uh, regulatory agencies and permitting agencies, which I think are going to be our greatest hurdles. And 
Larry, uh, maybe it's a two part question. Larry, you as a pioneer going through all this, uh, you see that breaking, breaking down some of these barriers uh, of entry in California? Larry. Um, well, I think that that's really is the key, the key piece is that we're a highly regulated in environments and with the cable landing in particular, what, what we're working on is that um, right now there's the world's longest uh, trans-Pacific broadband cable is going across the Pacific right now and is landing right at our property, right where we're proposing to do this. And so if you can, if you already know where these broadband cables have been going or where current cables are already in place, then the, the, that's what we'd like to do is to group them together. Now, the challenge, of course, is the transmission lines on the shore is that, you know, where the broadband cables, they have different infrastructure need than the transmission. And so, but to reduce impacts on fisheries is to identify those existing shore structures uh, and already existing underground communication cables that are in place and then try to group those together. And Finally, with the state's uh, money that they've allocated to Humboldt uh, to develop the port, they included an additional $6 million to really jumpstart the public participation process, tribal consultation, meeting with the fisheries. Uh, and so we've already started that process to really jumpstart the environmental review and the public participation process to get this show going. One of the biggest obstacles in my mind is within the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management lease process, uh, they basically just take and they sell it to the highest bidder. And what the communities really need to have is a, a community benefit component that goes to the offshore wind. And so therefore there's some resources that go back to the community and potentially offset some of the impacts uh, on the fisheries and local communities that may have the burden of the brunt of having these offshore wind resources in their community. Very good, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, other questions? Uh, I saw anybody got, uh, so uh, I had one question uh, that I saw, uh, Kevin, I think you asked this one. Uh, are, do, do we have an idea of how strong, I mean, big rogue waves of, uh, you know, we're starting to see uh, on, on the marine side, rogue waves are starting to show up more either because we're more aware of them or because they're out there. Uh, have you taken into account the threat of rogue waves hitting these turbines? And uh, if so, uh, what? how do you defense against them? Um, Yes, uh, so the, 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 um, the design it, it follows what ABS standards is a standard that ABS put together a document called the uh, Floating Offshore Wind um, uh, Design Document. So ABS had put together uh, design criteria for these, uh, for these farms, if you wish. And those include 500-year um, waves um, and um, for designing the morning system, for example. And uh, to give you a sense of scale, the 500-year wave is 70 feet high from peak to trough in the Gulf of Maine. So we're designing already for those with a safety factor on top of that. It just so turns out that, um, you know, if you have tsunami type waves and other type waves, um, uh, they're actually not as bad as, as, as those 500 year waves we're already designing for. Um, at least in the Gulf of Maine, I can't tell you what it would be like in, in the California environment, but certainly in the Gulf of Maine, those were the controlling uh, waves. And actually the conditions that control the design are not necessarily that. The mooring line, the mooring system is controlled by 500 year waves, but the actual hull design is controlled by combinations, 50 year events of winds and wave coming together. So, uh, so that's, that's what uh, controls the design of the hull versus, uh, yeah. So we, we're comfortable with where we are with our designs, if you wish, and uh, that we, we, we're not gonna have a, a, a rogue wave coming in and taking the unit down. But, uh, but certainly these things need to be looked at uh, in, in any design that you do, so. Um, and Habib, uh, you referenced the transmission line situation, and uh, we recalled the Atlantic wind connection challenges of, uh, of a decade ago. Uh, the need for a collaborative transmission approach did not work uh, back then, uh, and yet here we have a situation in which you've characterized everyone wants their own uh, uh, plug, electric plug to plug in. 
how can we move to a more collaborative approach on transmission or is transmission a separate uh, uh, vehicle that we're going to have to develop uh, independently but parallel to this? Very, very important question, Stas. I wish I have, I have a, a simple answer for you. I, I think there needs to be a, a leadership in Washington that's going to look at, at that. Just like we built the interstate highway system, we need to build an offshore uh, uh, transmission system for the country. And, and that needs to start at the top level. And, and uh, we haven't had that until, until uh, an interest to do that. Hopefully that, that will move forward as, uh, as a project. But uh, on, the, on, the, on the opposite side of things, you got to give the states the credit because they're the ones actually who put the power purchase agreements up that led to the projects we have today. So every, every, every state actually wanted to create an industry in their own state and start decarbonizing their economy. So they put up these, these goals and, and power purchase agreements. And so, so, um, so all these developers bid for them, won them, and now they want to plug to the grid. So, so if you've got that system kind of moving on its own, you've got the feds kind of waking up right now, and, and hopefully the two will come together. And, uh, in time, in time to, um, to, to allow this industry to move in a more um, uh, rational uh, uh, way for, at least for, for grid interconnection. Um, now, I, I said that grid interconnection was, uh, I, I should say the fishing industry is one of the biggest issues we had in Maine. I just want to say that's not the only issue. <laughs> I'm just trying to simplify that we have a lot of other issues as well that we had to deal with over the years uh, from an environmental ecological perspective, whether it's the right whales, whether it's uh, migratory birds, whether it's, uh, you know, undersea noise, whether it's visual impacts. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of other issues, of course, that we've, we've dealt with. But, uh, but uh, if you've asked me to pick one, I'd, I'd pick the fishing industry as being uh, near the top of, of the challenges that we face in Maine, but not the only challenge by any means. So. Stas, can I have a question? Go ahead. Yes, Dr. Uh, two questions. What makes the flotation columns float? Is it trapped yeah. air or do you have a buoyancy? It's a big air can. It's a big air can. It's all just trapped Made air. out of concrete. Now think about an air can instead of being, you know, three feet in diameter or whatever it is. Think about a 120 foot high by 40 foot diameter cylinder that's full of air. Okay. And, then, and what's the life expectancy of the, uh, of the flotation columns? Yeah. The, the hull itself, we, we've designed our holes in Maine for a hundred year life. Uh, uh, using segmental concrete construction because concrete is force tensioned and, and we've got um, a long history in segmental concrete bridges that we've, we've been able to build on, if you wish. So we've designed for a hundred year life, which means every, uh, every 25 years or so, when, when the turbine needs to be replaced, you can potentially throw the hull back, put a new turbine on and throw it back out. Uh, so that's the way we've designed the hull systems, which reduces the environmental footprint of the hull significantly. Uh, if you have two, two lives, then you've reduced your carbon footprint for the hull by factor two. If you have a three lives for the hull, you've reduced the, the carbon footprint by factor three. So we're shooting for four lives for the hull. Okay, A typical steel hull would have about a 25 year life. And uh, so we're shooting for, for a hundred year life, which is four, four typical lives, maybe three if you push the steel to 30 years. But, but, uh, but, uh, but three to four lifespans is what we're shooting for versus a traditional hull design. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Um, uh, Habib, how do, do we have the human resources in terms of engineering skills, in terms of uh, technical skills? I know you've said that we're borrowing a lot from the oil and gas industry, but we're not, uh, it's still where this is electricity, this is transmission lines, uh, these are floating structures. Uh, there's going to be much more maritime uh, applications here. Uh, people are going to have to go out and maintain those things. Uh, cable laying, uh, uh, offshore supply vessels, uh, actual construction, engineering drawings. Uh, and, and Larry's talking about having an army out there in uh, Humboldt Bay. Do we have the workforce to get this job done on a large national basis? No, <laughs> we, you know, we, we uh, let's put it this way. We, we have the workforce to get the first projects going, if you wish. But if we're going to scale up and do work at, at the scale that we want to, uh, we need to also train a lot of people. Uh, you, we need to train engineers. We need to train um, 
construction uh, folks. We need to train uh, electrical engineers. We need to train cable laying folks. We need more equipment, more vessels, more o &M vessels that needs to be built and pe train people on them and so forth. So there needs to be a parallel, if you wish. You're building a whole new industry. So yes, you can, you can, you can feed off the existing industries to a certain extent, but if you really want to scale up quickly, you need, you need a whole new workforce, a uh, larger workforce to, to, to move this forward. Um, beyond the one or two projects, so. Very good. Well, uh, that of course is a challenge for another day, but it's one that I suspect we're gonna be dealing with sooner rather than later. Uh, in California, we have a lot of concerns uh, around fires where our cable, where our, uh, our ca the power lines are above ground and we're starting to have uh, people demanding that uh, PG&E uh, underground those power lines Obviously, having an offshore cable uh, would be an aid to that, wouldn't it? Well, uh, yes, yeah, certainly the, the big fires you've had are a big issue, but the offshore cable is buried underground, certainly. So if you've taken a cable from a land-based power station to a community, you have a bigger risk because you're right, uh, 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 you have more of a uh, land-based portion that, that can cause some issues. Um, but, but, but I think the biggest issues we're, we're facing are T and D and not just transmission, but distribution as well. Uh, some of the dist distribution lines are, are, are an issue in California. But, but yeah, I think uh, offshore wind, if properly located, can reduce the, maybe the uh, uh, overland uh, transmission lines uh, to, to certain communities, yeah. Very good. Habib, I wanna thank you very much for an excellent presentation and uh, a regal eye opener. And, and Larry, thank you very much for uh, your participation as well. Uh, we are moving uh, slowly, but uh, uh, finally uh, to offshore wind and it's uh, been a long time coming. Uh, Clay will remember our, our uh, trip with Habib to visit skeptical port directors a long time ago, and uh, it's really good to see that Habib, you're, uh, you've been a prophet uh, who this time uh, has uh, been validated by the course of events. Uh, I wanna say that we are recording this. Uh, the recording will be made available tomorrow to all the participants. Uh, I've asked uh, Amber if she could send us a copy of your PowerPoint, Habib, uh, so we could get that as well, if that's okay. Uh, we're very interested in uh, your progress uh, in Maine, obviously, and hopefully uh, partnering with somebody on the uh, U.S. Pacific Coast at a, a future time. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you all for your participation today. Uh, we are off in uh, August. Um, I'm hoping for us to come live maybe in September or October, but uh, the situation is up in the air and uh, the board of directors will have to uh, meet to decide whether we're going to have a live uh, meeting and when we're going to do that. Uh, in September, we will be back and I will uh, uh, post our uh, uh, participants shortly. But in the meantime, I want to thank you all for your time and your energy. Frank Ramirez, if you're there, we need to get this guy out here more often. And uh, Larry, thank you very much. Clay and Stella, thank you for coming from Southern California. Uh, the Honorable George Laureate, my <laughs> good and loyal friend, thank you very much for being here and uh, for allowing me to cover this industry for 10 years. Hmm. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you all. Uh, we will be back in September and uh, you'll get a notification from me within the uh, next couple of weeks. Hi, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, Toss. Great show today. Nice Thank seeing you. you all. Thank, Thank you.